Ah, gracias. Eh, ¿Pregunto en español o en inglés? mejor. Sí, eh, pregunto en español, en inglés. Um, para lo, para lo, bueno, en español se, se lo traducen. Vale, ok, in, in English. So, um, two quick questions for uh, Dr. De, de Melier. Um, the first question, it, I think it is very important for, for research and also for treatments. Um, I would like to know, in your experience, whether um, you have found that um, over the course of, of the disease, of chronic Lyme, chronic Lyme disease, uh, the bacteria needs to be alive. I mean, um, and interacting with the immune system, creating this chronic uh, inflammatory setting. Or over time, you have found that um, the immune system can be stuck in this uh, inflammatory state, but the bacteria is not that important, like for instance, in um, rheum uh, rheumatoid fever. So and this would be the, the first one. And very quick uh, second uh, question. I think you have said that 60 or 70% of CFS patients do test uh, positive for, um, for Lyme disease or for Borrelia. So um, have you found in your experience that for these 60 or 70%, Borrelia is at the core of their uh, pathogenesis? And what is the cause um, of the other 40% aside from the di diabiosis that you have explained could be the cause of this 40%. Thank you so much. And the first question is simple, I don't know. Uh, the, the second question, yes, uh, a majority of CFS patients test positive for Borrelia, but how can you know that it's still the primary problem? Uh, it's likely that the Borrelia had, has played a role in the beginning of the disease and has changed a lot of things in the body and uh, also co-infections have had uh, an effect on, on the immunity and the TH1, TH2 switch that we see a lot in these, these patients. But it's, it's difficult to, at any point to say what the exact role is of the Borrelia at that time, only in the beginning of the disease, let's say in the first months, mm -hmm. you can definitely say that there is a, um, a, a, a time related thing with the, with the, with the bacteria, yeah. but later it becomes more and more difficult because we don't have any tissue concentrations of, of bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we don't know exactly, and there's so many secondary things that happen. And if you see in the old uh, literature on C ME CFS, there is a, uh, a GP from Great Britain who in the 50s has described how people with ME develop their disease. And that is identical with what we see in Lyme. So there, he describes four phases, like having an acute flu, being acutely sick or ill, and then um, different things change over time, and he describes four phases in total. And we see exactly the same thing with Lyme, but that's no proof that it, it's an identical situation. All right. So, uh, can the first question be addressed to the other doctors? I mean, do you find that chronic lightning seems really have needs to have uh, a live bacteria, or the immune system can be just um, set in an inflammatory condition, and the bacteria could be not that important? Just, just for any. I, I can answer. Uh, I think in the great majority of the cases, there, there are persistent bacteria because. Even because all the patients are not cured. Uh, some are cured rapidly and completely, other uh, decades after they are not cured. But when you give a new anti-infectious treatment, a new antibiotic, a new antiparasitic drug, even these not cured patients have sometimes strong uh, yarish hexheimer reaction, showing that uh, there is a... An, so I think, uh, because Dr. Zhang in the United States published a lot, it was in vitro studies about uh, many, uh, he studied the persistent forms around bodies. They, they go into biofilms, it has been shown by Eva Shapi also, and they, they can persist, they can escape completely all the antibiotics. They are not really resistant, they escape by uh, uh, staying uh, dormant. Uh, and, but 
in these patients uh, which are not cured, I think that there are other factors, autoimmune, genetic, uh, maybe factors of the environment, maybe in some patients uh, heavy metals, uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, vi virus probably, I'm sure that some chronic uh, viral infection may play a role. I remember an old study that was published in the Lancet or a journal like that a long time ago in the plaques of the multiple sclerosis, it's full of the HHV6 virus. Of course, many people have a benign infection with this virus, but maybe with other factors, it could play a role in multiple sclerosis with Borrelia and other factors. So now I see this chronic disease as a multifactorial disease. That's why uh, we should not call it anymore chronic Lyme disease. Uh, so PTLDS is not perfect because at the, at the beginning it was uh, created to say it's not infectious, but we can reuse PTLDS and yes, PTLDS is infectious or the, SP, the French SPPT or... Thank you. Prefiero mm, hablar en español porque mi inglés es muy malo. <risa> eh, mi pregunta es, bueno, pues estamos viendo hoy, yo, bueno, yo, era, yo soy médico infectólogo, pero de enfermedad de Lyme realmente sé muy poco y, y es la razón por la que he venido aquí, ¿no? Y porque cada vez veo algún paciente más que está en esta fase crónica y que todos sabemos, no sabemos muy bien esto que es, y bueno, este es el motivo. Entonces hay alguna cosa que también me ha sorprendido aquí, en el, uno es que se eh, detecta, la bacteria in semen con mucha frecuencia y entonces si esto tiene si se ha comprobado o se sospecha que pueda haber transmisión sexual por vía sexual porque también hemos visto que hay transmisión congénita y además bueno pues yo hoy viendo todo eh, esta mañana toda esta ponencia pues me doy cuenta que es una enfermedad muy parecida a la sífilis ¿no? Y es una espiroqueta, ¿no? Entonces se podría transmitir por vía sexual también, ¿no? Aunque la transmisión vía sexual pues, no se ha establecido pues, en, los, pues, en las guías que nos manejamos, sobre todo los médicos, infectólogos, internistas, tal… Pues a la vista de estos estudios y a la sospecha y casos de, pues de las parejas y demás que también empiezan con síntomas. Ya sabemos que las picaduras de garrapata pues muchas veces pues no tienen, uno no la recuerda, ya lo hemos visto en las distintas ponencias. O sea que tiene que haber algo más. Y en estos estudios, en uno de, el último de Mid Lenten, que era, es colaboradora de la doctora Eva Sapi, que se ha publicado este año, pues ha demostrado la la existencia de, en semen y en flujo vaginal. Incluso los, en la clasificación internacional, pues la transmisión materno-fetal pues ya se ha recogido, lo cual, claro, pues viene un poco a avalar que realmente tal. Y bueno, pues ya título así, pues antes comentaba ahí en el café, pues, pues casi, bueno, voy a decir, casi todas las parejas, pues habría que examinarlas en búsqueda de este tipo de enfermedad. Yo recuerdo un caso, pues también lo he dicho ahí, pues una familia, un, el paciente era guarda forestal en la zona de Burgos, hizo, le picó pues, algo, no sabe lo que era, y desarrolló una meningitis linfocitaria que bueno, pues, ha quedado con muchas secuelas neurológicas. Bueno, pues la mujer se la, me llamó su médico de primaria, la hizo la serología, la señora no tenía ningún síntoma de enfermedad de la la hizo las enologías y la daba positivo, con lo difícil que es que salga positivo, pero no solo a la mujer, sino a una niña de, de dos años que nunca jamás había subido al monte ni, ni nada de nada y también le salían las serologías positivas. Entonces, eso te hace sospechar que igual estamos hablando de garrapatas, pero igual hay muchos más vectores, mosquitos, etc., y no solo la vía de vectores, sino muchas más vías, porque al fin y al cabo es una espiroqueta más. I, I can give some uh, additional information. We have tested 200 couples 
uh, with Ellis spot test and 99% uh, were both positive. So 198 in 200, both were uh, Ellis spot positive. Ah, sí, eh, para, para todos, en cuanto a, a tratamientos, que se ha hablado poco, eh, ¿qué, ¿qué ven para el futuro en estos próximos, digamos, cinco años eh, que, que nos pueda, más allá de, de los antibióticos, por ejemplo, inhibidores de los receptores TLR, de los que se han hablado aquí, por ejemplo, trasplante de células autólogas, en, tras matar la, eh, la médula ósea con quimioterapia, eh, si pudierais, por favor, eh, abarcar este, esta, esta idea. Gracias. I can try to, to answer. Uh, I'm sure that for many patients, antibiotics is not the solution. Antiparasitics, sometimes it works, but uh, also for the long-term treatment, uh, all the Lyme doctors use uh, cytotherapy, essential oils. It, it works very well in some patients uh, because it maintains the condition and people continue to improve, but it's not working uh, well in everybody. Uh, so. I saw, as said, uh, Dr. De Merle, I have a colleague in France, uh, Dr. Gascon, who is an immunologist, and he, he's just patenting a discovery about the uh, immune profile in these uh, PTLDS patients. Uh, he shows, there are already publications showing immunosuppression in this patient, but he's showing that the CD4 lymphocyte that is killed in AIDS is not killed here, but is uh, not working anymore in, well. Um, he didn't tell to me anything because uh, there is a patent and he's not, it's not published yet. There is some secret about his discovery, but uh, he, he thinks that some, um, probably we could develop monoclonal antibodies to regulate some uh, immune cells. Uh, because I think if we don't make research on this field, we won't uh, uh, improve the condition of, the, of these relapsing patients because they. We, can, we cannot give antibiotics during decades. And, uh... Um, una, una cuestión de inmunología. Uh, hay una corriente de inmunólogos que ha, ha, ha aparecido a partir de Estados Unidos, donde consideran que las manifestaciones clínicas se deben a un exceso de inflamación, a la presencia de, de esta exagerada respuesta de TH1 y que mmm, abogan por aumentar lo que sería la tolerancia delante de la presencia de espiroquetas. Y ellos están utilizando, o se ha empezado a utilizar uh, low dosis de antígenos, de espiroquetas, para provocar precisamente esta, o para intentar provocar la tolerancia delante de, 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 este, de esta infección. ¿Qué opinan? ¿Es adecuado o no es adecuado? Uh, ¿Qué puede pasar cuando esta, este microorganismo no se trata? I think it's uh, too early to make decisions on that. Um, I think it's potentially dangerous uh, to lower sensitivity and, and because it's going to have uh, cross-reactions with other things. So I, I think um, this might be a solution in short term, but may backfire later. When I discussed with immunologists, they, they told me that in fact, it could be dangerous to... They, they had the idea for some cytokines that could be used, but if we remember the example of the studies about the septic shock, it was 20 years ago or more, the same uh, monoclonal antibody could uh, kill the patient or cure him uh, according to the time. It could be one hour apart uh, during the process of the shock it was uh, given. So. Uh, we, we should be cautious with this approach and uh, don't use possibly dangerous drugs. And 
tengo de, yo no tengo experiencia con el LDI, que es lo que me imagino de tal, pero bueno, la, en la manera de, de funcionar, ¿no? la terapia, estoy de acuerdo con ellos, que me parece un poco arriesgado, porque bueno, pues vemos que las consecuencias de la persistencia de estas bacterias viables pues tienen una serie de, de consecuencias clínicas que no son telenables, vamos. Um, sí, en cuanto a, a los vectores, um, en cuanto a otros vectores a, a, más allá de las garrapatas, eh, se, ha, se ha encontrado la Borrelia burgdorferi en, en, en mosquitos y, y en otros uh, vectores, pero no se ha demostrado que estos vectores sean infecciosos. En vuestra experiencia clínica eh, hay, existen otros vectores además de las garrapatas. Gracias. I agree with you. There is a study about mosquitoes, but I think they are very bad vectors. Maybe uh, it may uh, transmit in exceptional condition of weather. I don't know, but uh, there is no epidemiological evidence that uh, they play a role. In my experience, I don't know the name in English. We call Tan in French, T-A-O-N. It's a oh, it's a horsefly in English. Uh, I have a. Um, Regularly, patients who told me that they started their disease after the horsefly bite. Uh, they are very insects, I don't know really. Maybe it happens, uh, but if it happens, it's uh, rare, I think. Pues entre que solo el casi 30% de los pacientes recuerdan que le haya pecado una garrapata y, y que son pacientes que a muchas veces no tienen ninguna actividad, digamos, de riesgo pues eso hace sospechar que haya muchos otros vectores, quizás no estudiados o no bien conocidos, que lo puedan transmitir. Al doctor Schettler, eh, habló, usted, habló usted de low doses of eh, naltrexon y habló de vida media de la naltrexona por seis horas, pero luego recomendaba tomar la naltrexona una vez por día. La vida media de la naltrexona es de seis horas, dijo usted, y después recomendó tomar la naltrexona una vez cada 24 horas. ¿Por qué? Sí, bueno, esa es en realidad una pregunta muy buena. La vida total de la naltrexona es solo cuatro horas. Así que, básicamente, hay actividad en los receptores por cuatro horas. Now, what we also know is, uh, if you really want to know how fast a molecule is metabolized, you also need to check the half-life of the further metabolites. And the main further metabolite is 6 beta natalexol and there is a half-life of, of 10 days, so it takes more than one month before it's completely cleared out of our body. So I think this is one part how fast is it cleared out, and this takes a lot of time, but how long is the activity on receptor level, and this is only four hours. So, uh, basically, on treatments with LDN, uh, we don't recommend to combine with uh, molecules like, analgesic molecules like codeine and, and so on, but uh, in uh, some treatments, I see that still, It is combined, but let's say minimum four or six hours interval between LDN and the analgesics. But that's uh, according to what I see in, in protocols. But the activity is only a couple of hours. Hello, thank you very much. Um, quería, quería preguntar um, el tratamiento con ozono, si tienen alguna experiencia, dada el efecto antibiótico y inmunomodulador del ozono, eh, o, o bien solo o bien asociado con antibióticos 
orales o, y sistémicos, ¿no? con los antibióticos. Los protocolos que se suelen utilizar de antibiótico, si tendría algún sentido sumar el, el ozono. Si tiene alguna experiencia al respecto. Ozone is used to uh, treat viral infections. Uh, it, ozone is used to uh, treat viral infections. It has an effect of about 24 hours. So it's, uh, it's very good if you get flu or you get a common cold, it will, it will help. And uh, in patients with multiple viral reactivation, it will also help. But I don't think it, it's of any use in, in, in the Borrelia treatment. Um, and also, you produce a lot of free radicals. Your uh, nitric oxide, which you produce in the late stage of um, inflammation, which is another type of inflammation than in, in normal inflammation, you produce a lot of NO, nitric oxide. And if you are going to give ozone, you're going to produce a lot of peroxynitrate, which is the most dangerous uh, free radical there is. And it's especially Uh, toxic to the gray matter of the brain. So at the same time, if, you, if you're going to use um, 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 this kind of treatment, any oxygen treatment, you also have to give protection against peroxynitrate. So um, in, in people who are not experienced, who just give ozone for all sorts of, of therapies, I think uh, should, you not, should not send uh, Lyme uh, patients to them because uh, I think there's a lot of side effects of, of the treatment and the treatment outcome is, is not, not spectacular. Could I maybe add something more to my... I would like to add another part because, uh, I'm sorry, I missed this first part, and that's why I probably was not complete in my answer. For LDN, you should not have an activity of 24 hours, because the activity is just based on the fact that you only have this brief blockade, and as a result, you upregulate your endorphins, and they are uh, rebalancing uh, the immune system. So the activity, let's say 24 hours on receptors, That's the activity that we see with a full dose naltrexone in treatment of, of addiction. But in this particular case, you only need this brief blockade, and that's why you only have this activity of four hours. So I, I'm sorry if I missed uh, uh, this part, but I think the answer is now more complete. Gracias. Eh, I use naltrexone low doses eh, for, for many time. And always eh, three or, or four and fifty eh, milligrams only only one time a day. Yeah, if, if for me the if for me the surprise about the the medium life. Oh yeah. yeah. But it's it's correct, it's only one nice. a day. Thank you very much. Eh, sí, mire, eh, última pregunta para irnos a comer, que se está dilatando un poquito, aunque es muy interesante todas las preguntas y las charlas de la mañana. Vamos concretando, por favor. Eh, con respecto a los test serológicos, eh, se dice que, bueno, según los estudios, no es, no es tan confiable, no, no confirma la enfermedad sin, ni la descarta, 
por qué se recomienda, se recomienda siempre pedirlas y si fuera, puede ser una cosa que, que pueda disminuir los costes a nivel sanitario. ¿no? Y otra cosa sería sobre preguntar sobre el eh, nivel de estudio sobre investigación sobre la, las vacunas sobre la enfermedad, si supieran algo de eso. Yes, so in terms of why are the serological tests promoted, um, again, you have to understand that the global policy for this disease basically came from the United States. And it is um, affected by financial incentives and motivations that are part of the U.S. system. So the serology tests basically are promoted. The IDSA works very closely with insurance companies. And insurance companies do not want to cover the cost of this disease. So this promotion of decades for a very bad test is a way to basically deny many people who are sick a positive diagnosis. So even though the reliability of the test is very poor, it is used as a way to offload the costs of, of diagnosis and treatment for the disease. That's one thing. Secondly, CDC and NIH officials hold patents on serology tests. And they, these institutions are benefiting directly, financially, from these old patents, as well as our individual senior officials, some of who are now retired, benefiting from them. And so they do not want to see competitors come in with better diagnostics to compete. It's a very big market share. It's a big financial thing. The average Lyme patient in the US and in many other countries will pay out of pocket multiple times in order to have a positive test. Each test is over $100. It's not uncommon for a Lyme patient to spend for five or 10 tests, $1,000, just to get a positive test. So that is a lot of money going towards the test manufacturers. There are now 43 different organizations that have the same serology tests that have been FDA cleared because there is so much money to be made off of Lyme serology tests. Does everybody understand? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, and the these vaccine. People, these people at the yeah. CDC, at yeah. just close your mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, and I just wanted the vaccine, you. sorry, the vaccine. So the situation with the vaccine is, um, I'm not a scientist or medical person, but I do know that um, when they re reshaped the serology test back in the early 90s, they took out a certain biomarker that they were going to use as part of the vaccine um, Limerex vaccine, it's called an OSPE. It's one of the biomarkers. So we used to be tested for Lyme with OSPE because it was the most reliable biomarker to say, yes, it's unique to Lyme, you have OS this OSPE, you definitely have Lyme. So we have OSA, OSB, OSC. Well, they wanted to incorporate it into the vaccine, and so they could not use it in a diagnostic test because if you got vaccinated, you would test positive. So they took it out of the serology test. Unfortunately, and again, I don't know all the physiology around this, but very shortly after the Limerex vaccine came out, there were a thousand adverse reactions. And these were reported to the FDA. Um, Cliff uh, Smith Klein Beecham, the manufacturer of the Limerex vaccine, paid out a uh, million dollars in settlement almost immediately after the vaccine came out, and then they just kind of shut down production. Um, there is some discussion as to why there was adverse reactions. Some people believe that the introduction of the OSPE through the vaccine process may have created uh, almost like an infectious process in response, but that's still being debated. The current vaccine, I understand, is very similar in structure, so it may have the same problems, um, but it's very much, again, it's a huge money maker. If you get on a CDC list for vaccines, you are guaranteed, the CDC puts out a list of recommended vaccines. If you get on a list, you're um, guaranteed between two and four billion dollars in profit a year. Just to, to add a comment about PCR, uh, the people, uh, the official people who, 
who win millions of dollars with uh, serology as a center-right editorial to say PCI is not good and they try to block PCI everywhere in the world. And Dr. Li, who is a Chinese-American uh, researcher, uh, is attacking injustice the CDC to block his test, which was validated. And uh, we, we see the same thing in France when the PCR are, are done by lab, uh, vet labs, they, they condemn. And for the vaccine, the optimistic thing in the evolution of the vaccine policy, as they have new vaccines in the tubes with uh, several species of Borrelia, I'm not sure it will uh, uh, be the solution for everything because we have so many species. But uh, in fact, the vaccine industry is pushing for the kind of some recognition of the chronic Lyme problem because they have a huge market. So uh, they could help us with their view. So that's a positive point of view for me. Bueno, siento que no se puedan hacer más preguntas, pero es que no se nos ha pasado el tiempo bastante.